right, let's take our soul-stirring songs and hymns, hymnal, turn to hymn number 150. 150, let's stand. My faith has found a resting place. Hymn number 150. My faith has found a resting place. men to come and we remain standing we'll uh, pray and there's another opportunity again to give back unto the Lord but also to have a part in helping our church to take care of God's man and so you give as the Lord leads you I sure do appreciate Brother Douglas and Rafe helping us this week with the offering and we'll ask Brother Douglas if he would to please word our prayer for us tonight Whenever you go somewhere to hope to be a blessing, it's often uh, you that receives more of the blessing by serving. And it, that's been the case this week as we've enjoyed getting to know the people of Emmanuel Baptist Church. This spirit-filled, gathered congregation here at the Church of Jacksonville, Texas. And we're so glad that we get to partner together with you for revival. And that's more than just a date on the calendar. It's uh, something that we hope would happen, and that's when all of God's people that meet together are gathered around the Word of God and decide to obey it. It's uh, it's church as it as it's meant to be. It's God's people as they are meant to 
to live. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to experience when true revival comes. There's repentance before God. There's confession of sin. There's forgiveness between brethren. There's glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the gospel proclaimed. There's uh, witness that happens. And so we're very thankful that we get a chance to uh, partner together with you this week. Our first song tonight is a song that was written by Hannah, Hannah Grace Johnson right here on the end. And it, this was earlier this year. We were in a revival, and something akin to revival took place. It was just a, glorif a glorifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, uh, the pastor was pointing to people that weren't there um, before the pandemic happened. He was pointing to newly saved individuals that the Lord brought to their church. He was pointing to places all over the building that the Lord had brought in. He pointed to an expanded church property that the Lord was able to give them. And uh, there was confession of sin. The gospel was proclaimed. And it was just a day of testimony and rejoicing. And when Hannah got home, she took her legal pad she went to her room and started writing furiously. And then uh, two hours later, she came down and she, she said, Dad, I think I wrote a song. And I said, all right, let me hear it. She sang two lines of the song and a tear leapt out of my face. She said, Dad, is that a song? I said, yeah, that's a song, baby. It was wonderful. It was based off of Psalm 46. And uh, uh, listen, to, listen to these words. As, uh, as we sing them. God's people all throughout history have been a grateful people. What's the earmark of a revived church? A church that is grateful. Sing praise to God who reigns above, the God of all creation. We need to let his praises be heard in his church. Are you a thankful person? Can you recognize what God has done for you? When you look back, yeah, there's hard times. When you look just over your shoulder, you can see what the Lord has brought you through. And you ought to see his salvation every single day. And our response is very simple. It's very simple for us today. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. 
mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend the agony of Calvary through the perfect holy one crushed your son drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you Once your enemy Now seated at your table Jesus, thank you By your perfect sacrifice I've been Thank you, the Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you, once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you, the Father's wrath completely Jesus, thank you, once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Oh, we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? And uh, thank you so much, Mitchell and June, for uh, singing with us. Thank you, Hannah, for introducing your song as well. Um, as we uh, get closer to the message, we want to understand what the Lord is doing. And often, we won't fully understand what the Lord has done in our life, what the Lord has uh, allowed us to go through, and the Lord, what the Lord has spared us from. In fact... As I read Revelation chapter 6, there's a gathering of martyrs around the throne. Now, as I look out here, I don't see any martyrs. Nope, you're still breathing. Still got blood pumping. Because you haven't given the ultimate sacrifice for the Lord. But those that have, even if they fully didn't understand why they'd gone through what they'd gone through, they asked this question. Maybe you've asked this question before. How long? Oh Lord, how long? How long? You're, maybe you've looked at this world and you've asked, how long? How long until there's justice? How long until there's judgment? How long until you make everything that is wrong right? How long? Those martyrs ask that question after they've given the ultimate sacrifice. But the assurance comes when the words of our Lord came, all shall be fulfilled. Well, who's doing the fulfilling? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's got the whole world in his hands. He knows, aren't you thankful for this? He knows the end from the beginning. We can only see what's happening right now. He knows where he's taking us. And that's really the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And what was that mind? He endured the cross for you. And so we can endure anything because we know that God is going to work all things together for his good pleasure. carry 
because he loves me. This is the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. his mind in us. We'll go through things we wouldn't thought we wouldn't have thought possible with his mind in us. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. Unfortunately, his timing is better than our timing. What a mess we'd be in if we were in charge of time. Ooh, we'd be in a mess. So since God's in charge anyway, we might as well not just let God take the wheel, but we ought to give the Lord everything we have because everything we have, he's given us in the first place. So give it all back to him. So today, that can be our prayer. This is our invitation song before the message begins. Lord, just take everything. Use me. Take all of me.
Do it one more time. Well, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, let's take the time to turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, if you will. And go ahead and find your place in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, I couldn't have picked a better hymn to sing, and I couldn't have picked a better scripture text to read from at the start of our service. That's the Holy Spirit's leading. I don't think we even talked about that. We are given in Christ and in the word of God a strong consolation. As we read in Hebrews today. And it's amazing what promises we bypass when we look at some of these larger doctrinal portions. If you find your place there in 2 Thessalonians, look at chapter 2. And I want to kind of dive into this text in verse 13. And if there's a prayer or a hope that I have for you, it would be these words. Look at verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father which hath loved us. And hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts. Establish you in every good work. Oh, we're, get, we're given a wonderful promise. And if this could be a salutation or a prayer that I have for you and this church, it would be this, these words in this text. It's amazing where this promise where this hope comes from, it comes right in the heart of a, of a dissertation about the imminent return of Jesus Christ. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is what we're all looking for. We're looking for the rapture of the saints and then he will come again with his saints. He's coming for his saints and then he's coming with his saints. And the rapture could take place at any given point. There's nothing that needs to happen on God's timetable to preclude the rapture. 
It's called the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He could come tonight. In fact, that truth, that promise is called our blessed hope. We're to take hope and comfort in that. So if I could give you any hope or comfort or something that you could stand fast in and not be moved, it would be what we see in the text of this particular chapter. We're given blessed hope. Jesus is coming again. Remind everybody that Jesus is coming again. Tell your neighbor that Jesus is coming soon. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and I change the words whenever I lead it, and will be soon. It's coming soon. That changes everything for the life of a Christian. It prioritizes everything in your life. But it's interesting to see this major doctrine of the return, the rapture of his saints, the second coming. This is one of my favorite ones to hear about. I love a prophecy conference. I love to hear about uh, eschatology of the things to come. That's the study of what's going to come in the future, prophecy, if you will. But sometimes these major scriptures or doctrines, or our favorite ones, as you might say, tend to overshadow a, a great promise, a promise for us right now. A look here in verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts. Establish you in every good word and work. The word consolation is an old English word that simply means encouragement. It means comfort, if you will. And it's the truth here that God has given us everlasting consolation. So if I could give a title to this, it would be everlasting comfort. Church. You are not to move, not to be shaken from everlasting comfort. His mercies are from everlasting to everlasting, and you should abide in the comfort of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. Look at that word, consolation. It's the Greek word, ready? I don't want to get too fancy here, but it's the word paraklesen. Uh, you get the word paraclete, the Holy Spirit is called the one who's called alongside, the comforter, the one who comforts. And it's the same word that's the beginning word of verse 17, consolation and comfort. They are the exact same word, paraclesen. I'm amazed at how much scriptural truth teaches us that God doesn't want his people to be defeated, discouraged, or have depressed lives. Now, he acknowledges that oftentimes Christians are defeated. He shows us that despair in the lives of Elijah. He has a great spiritual victory and then runs away from a woman and then cries. And Jesus said, uh, eat, eat a sandwich, take a nap. There are 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee. The life of David, the highest and lowest of human emotions is found in the heart of the Bible, if you will. In, the, in our Psalms and in the poetical books, you see the longing, you see the defeat, you see the success in, in communicated through King David. You see Job, what victory is at the end of the book, but he went through the loss of his family, the loss of his livelihood. You see the apostle Paul going through his list of suffering. But over and over and over again, God shows us that eventually those Christians got victory and that everybody in this room who names the name of Jesus Christ has been given by Christ and God the Father this everlasting comfort. And the secret to that comfort is the peace that John 14 says that the world can't give to us. There is no worldly substitute for this kind of comfort. John 14, 27 says this, peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So I'd like us to consider tonight the everlasting comfort of God. If it were possible for you and I to offer the world a 
formula or a pill or a diet or a seminar or a nasal spray. I think that's one of the, the newest remedies for COVID, or the no, newest COVID blocker. If I could give one counseling session or one consultation that would give the world permanent, everlasting comfort or consolation in their heart, I'd make a fortune. If I had that formula, I'd win every Nobel Prize, award, and accolade this world has to offer. Not to mention that I'd put out every business that gains billions and billions of dollars generated by psychology and self-help books and aromatherapy and pharmaceuticals, both legal and illegal, and even essential oils. <laughs> even alcohol. Did you know that there's a brand of liquor called Southern Comfort? Don't ask me how I know that. Uh, here's the original slogan of Southern Comfort. Two per customer, no gentleman would need ask for more. Rocker Janis Joplin was famous for singing on stage, holding in one hand a microphone and in the, in the other hand a bottle of Southern Comfort. The question is, what kind of comfort did it offer her? Apparently not much, because she died of an overdose at age 27. The comfort that's offered in drugs or alcohol or therapies or even religion is transitory. That, that means temporal. Because it has a, an end date, an expiration date, it's ineffective. That is not everlasting comfort. But God gives us, as his child, according to his word, everlasting comfort. This means it's permanent, it's powerful, it's ever-present, and it's demonstrated in three ways. And the goal is very simple. Understand it more, and then to embrace the comfort that we already have. And here's three ways in which the human heart, which has a need that's been answered by God alone, this is a need for comfort. And number one, it's a comfort to the lost. Number one, it's a comfort to the lost. Look at verse 13 and 14, please. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. And here it is, underline it, highlight it, circle it, and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, follow this carefully, please. The greatest single need of the human heart is summarized in one word. S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N. Salvation. You must be saved. You know this because all men are sinners. And the heart of man is is empty. Man is lost. Man is hungry. And man tries to fill that void that's in his heart with all kinds of comforters that never last. Uh, you've heard of comfort foods, haven't you? We just ate one of my favorite comfort foods, Tex-Mex. I believe the marriage supper of the lamb is going to be in great part Tex-Mex. You've heard of comfort foods like snacks or dishes that regardless of their nutritional value or lack thereof, they satisfy that certain longing. There's a nostalgia or a sentimental value with these certain foods. They're called comfort foods. But incidentally, the first time that the word comfort food or the words comfort foods were used in advertising was in 1966 when they were nostalgic for depression era foods. Krispy Kreme donuts. Oh, yes. <laughs> Comfort food. Macaroni and cheese. For some people, that's a comfort food. Biscuits and gravy. Chicken fried steak. Hey, it's the fall. Ready? Grilled cheese and tomato soup. For some of you, it's different. Maybe it's barbecue. Maybe it's Mexican street tacos or beef jerky or Chicago style pizza. Uh, when I was in college, we had some people from Ohio that would just rant and rave about Skyline Chili. 
If you've been to Kentucky or Ohio, you've run into Skyline Chili. And you can have Skyline Chili five ways. Basically, it's spaghetti with chili on top. And I think they put nutmeg on it. It completely ruins it. Let me tell you, it's way overrated. Those Ohioans ain't never been nowhere. I don't even think they know why they like it. It just happens to be close to home. But like comfort food, like, like food comforts, but comfort fades, right? Unless it stays on your hips for a while. Then it stays a little bit longer. Well, so it is for man and his hungry soul that tries to find comfort in religion. Do this. Follow these rules. The man who pursues after money. The woman who attempts to find a filling in success or things. You know, it satisfies for a moment, but ultimately it will betray you. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man was in hell and he lifted up his eyes. You know what? He lived his entire life for the pursuit of earthly comfort, creature comfort, ease. And Jesus tells the story. All he wanted, all this rich man wanted when he lifted up his eyes, was a single drop of cold water. He wanted one more taste of material comfort. Abraham said across the way, he said this, now you're tormented, but Lazarus is comforted. Oh, everlasting comfort isn't found in a drop of water or any material pleasure. Not the purple and fine linen that the rich man would dress in. It's only found in Christ alone. It's everlasting comfort. So it may be that you're saved today. And yes, you need another phone. You might need another computer. You may need another car. You may need another job. You might need glasses at a certain point. You might need a new body. If you're a child of God and you've been born again... You do not need, nor will you ever need, another salvation. You'll never need another gospel. You'll never need another savior. And you'll never need another spiritual answer for your soul. Why? Because in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life, everlasting assurance, and everlasting salvation. John 6, verse 35, reads this way. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. So all of your thirst can be quenched in the water of life. Your hunger can be satisfied with Jesus, the bread of life. That's everlasting life. And as such, it is everlasting comfort. I am comforted now because the greatest need that I ever had or ever will have has been met in Christ permanently. Do you know what causes anxiety? Uh, two years ago, before the pandemic, it was called the age of outrage. If you post any opinions at all, that means there's a wave of outrage. People get triggered by other people's opinions. They don't know what to do with any difference of opinion or opposition. But now we've gone, because, because we've taken our our outrage and we kept it indoors and we have no personal inner communication skills or no outlet, this is the age of anxiety. And what causes anxiety? Anxiety is caused when a Christian fixates and obsesses over the least and most unimportant needs of their life. Why? Because they're all temporary. They're all temporal. They all have a time stamp on them. There's anxiety because you're not thinking about what's eternal. Uh, there's a candy derived from the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It's made by Willy Wonka, and it's called the Everlasting Gobstopper. Anybody know what that candy is? Sunday school teachers, I know you do. Children's church workers, of course. Willy Wonka said, it's the last one you'll ever need. How many of you know what these are, these Everlasting Gobstoppers? I thought about this. Have you ever wondered why there's more than one in a box? That's the world's idea of everlasting, right? The world's idea of everlasting comfort in religion or philosophy or science, it's all a lie. It's interesting to note 
that religion in the West has always been interested in the religion of the East. In Hollywood and in the media, celebrities have tried everything under the sun. In Steven Seagal's house right now, living there in his house are Buddhists. And one on one side, burning incense and chanting. And then on the other end of the house, there would be numerous Hindus reading their Nevadas and reciting them. And in the middle, there were psychics and soothsayers. These are people hired to live with him in his mansion and practice every form of religion you can imagine. They were trying it all. Do you realize that Michael Jackson tried Jehovah's Witness, but also Scientology, but also the Nation of Islam all rolled up into one? He tried everything, this and that, all rolled up into one. And they were obviously hungry still. As I hear about the world's extreme search for this comfort that we find in Christ, I'm, remo- I'm reminded of the poem or the poet written, excuse me, the poet E.E. E. Hewitt. Her pen name was Liddy H. Edmonds. And if you look on, on him 150 in your hymn book right in front of you, you can find her name written there. Liddy H. Edmonds. She was Eliza Hewitt. And she had a spinal condition that left her shut in for most of her life. She was locked in a room in the late 19th century. And while she was shut in, she thought, at least I could write some of my poems for my children's church class at our church. And that's what she did. And one of the poems that she wrote for her primaries is this hymn that we sing. She also wrote, more about Jesus would I know. There is sunshine in my soul when we all get to heaven and many, many others. Listen to what she wrote. Read it, if you will. Hymn 150. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Everlasting consolation is everlasting consolation for the lost because your faith has found a resting place. It's everlasting comfort because there's everlasting life through one way, salvation by Christ. So if you're in this room today and you don't have that comfort, you don't have this everlasting consolation, maybe you're watching and you recognize that you're lost, you're a sinner, and that you need to be saved. Jesus Christ is the only Savior for your hungry soul. Number one. Jesus is an everlasting comfort to the lost. Number two, Jesus provides everlasting comfort to the least, to the least, the least and lowest. Notice notice how powerfully the love of God is demonstrated in our text. Look at verse 13. He calls us beloved of the Lord. Oh, that's a great compliment. You can be called the called out, faith-filled, assembly of God, you can be called Christians, but I love this expression, call one another beloved of the Lord. Try it out, beloved of the Lord. Look at verse 16. The Lord Jesus Christ and God, which hath loved us. He loves us, and you know this. You know this from personal experience. There is no human experience more discouraging and debilitating than the feeling of rejection, the feeling of being unloved. In fact, that's the reason that the comfort industry even exists. And it's so huge in society that millions of people feel unloved, unlovely, and unwanted. These are the least and the lowest. Even those who have tasted of what it means to be beloved by another person They also know what it's like to lose and miss that love when that person leaves or passes away. That love is gone. The comfort of love in the context of this world is always temporary. It's always transitory. But listen to the love of God. Psalm 103, 17. But the mercy of our Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Jeremiah 31, 3. Yea, 
I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. If God has ever loved you, then he always loves you. His love doesn't fade like the world's love. Uh, someone said that love is so fleeting between newly married couples that it's tempting to give the bride and groom paper plates instead of china. Listen, God's love isn't like that. God wants us to be comforted. God wants us to know the truth. God loves you. Tell the world, God loves you. Start your gospel conversation by saying those three words. Hey, God loves you. Listen to this kind of love. Listen to how it's demonstrated to us. Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's an everlasting comfort. It's an everlasting consolation because there's everlasting love. God loves you and that love don't stop. I officiated my sister's wedding in North Carolina. And I did, as I did the research uh, to find what I hoped to include on her wedding day charge, I came, I came across new wedding vows. And one set of vows that I came across was pretty traditional, except that it included this phrase, to love and cherish as long as love shall last. That's reassuring, isn't it? <laughs> I know a few couples that wouldn't have survived the honeymoon if it was as long as love shall last. It reminds me of the man who had his credit card stolen a while back and he never reported it because he said that the thief charges a whole lot less than my wife ever did. <laughs> as long as love shall last, I guess. Here's good news. No matter what you're going to look like a hundred years from now, or no matter what people think of you, no matter what successes or failures you're going through in life, no matter how many millennium have passed through history, you will always, always, always be loved as a child of God. Amen. Scripture calls you His beloved. And as we noted, who shall separate us from that love? Could I answer the question? Nothing and no one shall separate us from that love. That's a comforting truth. I'm taking comfort in that truth tonight. That's our goal, to take comfort in it tonight. You can take comfort that even if the whole world hates you, you'll never be outside of the love of God. We have something greater than even the love of a mother. We have the eternal and perfect love of God for his own. Now, we're in a hostile world. Uh, we're enemies. Uh, it, it, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, calls us strangers and pilgrims on earth. But that doesn't change the fact that God loves us. God so loved us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't just say it, he proved it. He showed it. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 tells us, Behold, look at this, look at this example. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. What kind of love is this? That God gave His only begotten Son. It's a comfort to the lost. It's a comfort to the least. And it's a comfort to the loneliest. It's a comfort to the loneliest. Look at verse 16, please. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath, give, and hath given us everlasting consolation and, underline these next two words, and good hope through grace. You know what good hope is? It's not, I hope the University of Texas Longhorns beat Kansas this Saturday. You're going to be sorely disappointed. That's a meager hope. But this is a good hope. This is an absolute hope. 
A Scottish pastor once noted, the most profane word you can use toward a believer is hopeless. For when you tell a Christian that his situation is hopeless, you're attempting to slam the door in the face of God. I'm glad he said attempting because you really can't stop this love. Romans chapter 15 verse 13 tells us, describes who God is in our life. Ready? Now the God of hope. Oh, that's a beautiful description of our Lord. He is the God of hope. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in this hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. He's called the God of hope. Isn't that wonderful? This is a God of everlasting consolation. He's also the God of hope. There will never be a situation that you find yourself in that will ever be described as hopeless. Well, that's not true, preacher. I just got the diagnosis. I've got cancer. And it's in the late stages. Could I assure you with some absolute truth? Number one, God is powerful enough to heal cancer. I've seen him do it. Number two, if God doesn't heal it here, he heals it there. That's everlasting hope. Rachel, we're walking through a, Rachel and I were walking through a market setting on vacation. We've had one of those, I think, once before. And there was somebody standing outside of a cosmetic store inviting us to try a free sample of the newest line of moisturizer. He placed it right here on the outside of my eyes. I guess that's where I needed it. We were tempted to buy it, in case you were wondering where this 12-year-old skin came from. We didn't buy it, by the way. Uh, did you know that there's a moisturizer called Hope in a Jar? Don't ask me how I know that either. Hope in a Jar. They're marketing hope in a jar. It's another reminder that every remedy, fix, Upgrade or augmentation that I do to my body is another reminder that it won't last. But you have, as a child of the living God, what Colossians 1.27 tells us we have. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's hope in a jar, this little broken jar. We have this truth in earthen vessels. Your hope is Christ in you, the hope of glory. No wonder God said that this was an everlasting comfort. He doesn't say that you're going to have it, or you might have it, or you should look forward to it, or you should have it, or you should work to get it. No, you just have it, whether you embrace it or not. It's an everlasting comfort to the lost, to the least, and to the loneliest. His mercy, his salvation, and his love is eternal for you. So I ask this question. I ask this question looking in the mirror. Don't you think it's time to take comfort as a child of God and to do exactly what it says to do in verse 17? Look here, verse 17. Comfort your hearts. And what's our response? Ready? Establish you in every good word and work. It's God's will for every believer in this room, wherever you are, if you're saved, you are to walk out of these doors established, strengthened, encouraged, unwavering, fixed, firm, not moving, faithful in your words and faithful in your work. What you say and what you do demonstrates that you have this hope that the world doesn't give us and that the world doesn't understand. That is constant, abiding comfort. The way that you walk and the way that you talk tells the world that you have everlasting comfort. In fact, one of the reasons why God gave you this peace that the world can't give and doesn't understand is it so that we can shine in this world as lights in a dark place, testifying to the God of all comfort. Another accurate description of who God is. He's the God of all comfort. That's why one of our titles is not just beloved of the Lord, it is overcomers. We're the overcomers. 
We're not trying to overcome. We are overcomers. Because he overcame the world, this is an everlasting comfort that we have a part in overcoming. Yogi Berra had some amazing quotations. They were funny. They contradicted themselves. And he said of Nolan Ryan and the 1969 Amazing Mets, he said of the description of that team, he said, we were overwhelming underdogs. That's brilliant. Of course, we are underdogs too. The Bible says that we're strangers and pilgrims in this current world. 1 Corinthians describes us this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Listen to this. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made the filth of this world. We're the off-scouring of all things unto this day. But one of the reasons that we're overcomers is that we have this everlasting consolation, this supernatural peace. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Look here in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Look at the first chapter. Remember what context we're dealing with, that blessed hope of the imminent return of Jesus Christ for his saints. Ready? Look at verse 6, if you will. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, of course, we're troubled. Paul said um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, there's a wonderful song called the Corinthian song that has this text set, set to music. But listen, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Notice in our text, verse 7 of chapter 1, and to you who are troubled, rest. I think it's Amazing, the proximity of those two words. Hey, anybody troubled here? Rest. Troubled? Rest. If that's a description of the Christian in this world, I don't know what a better description of it. Troubled? Rest. Trouble is temporary. The rest is forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. All of your hardships that you're going through right now are the worst things that you have ever been through or will ever go through at the very hardest will be over. They're going to be gone. All of the love, the salvation, the joy, and the glory of this life as a child of God will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. The worst parts about you are going to burn but the best parts about you, Christ has done it and it's going to last forever. And God wants you and I tonight to take this comfort into the world that has no comfort. And well, they shouldn't. They shouldn't have comfort. They shouldn't be resting in all of the material things. It's all temporary. It's all going to burn. Rest in God's love. Rest in God's hope. And rest in God's salvation. And God wants us to make a difference in this world, doesn't he? So don't move. I shall not be moved from the everlasting comfort that only comes through Jesus Christ. We're going to stand together. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed as we have been. We had a commitment every time that we met. Will you say yes to the word of God? Many of you have already committed to be here every service and you're here again tonight. You've invited somebody. Maybe somebody invited you to the service. All of you here, here's the question for you. Maybe, you. maybe you'd say, I'm a believer, but I'm not sure that I've appropriated this birthright of consolation and comfort that's mine. I'm saved, but I sure needed this reminder. Everything that's good about you is from God and it goes on forever. Everything you don't like, the aches, the pains, the heartaches, the debts, those are all temporary and fleeting. Could I ask you this? What are you going to fixate on? What are you going to dwell on? Temporary stuff? You say, I'm saved, but I needed this reminder as a child of God. Who would say that? You say, I needed this reminder. Simply raise your hand. Wonderful. I wonder who would say, 
I'm here today, but I'm not saved. I don't have everlasting anything. I don't have everlasting comfort because I don't even have everlasting life. I need it. I want it. Listen, if you're that way, you say, I don't have everlasting life. I've never placed my faith in Jesus Christ. I don't want to embarrass you at all, but I want to pray for you. You say, I'm not saved, or I've, but I'd like to be sure. Is there anybody like that? Simply put up your hand. No one's looking around. You say, Brother Johnson, would you pray for me? I'm not going to point you out. You say, I'm not saved or I'm not sure. Raise your hand. Anybody like that? You'd like everlasting life. You'd like me to pray. Listen, God sent his son to die for you, to give you everlasting life and provide this everlasting comfort that starts as soon as you receive Christ. The God of all comfort wants to give you comfort in the things that really matter, the things that last forever. I'm gonna pray. Christians are already doing business up here at the altar. As I pray, ask the Lord to do his work in your heart. Father, I pray that those who have comfort and strength in the inner man as their spiritual birthright, I pray that they would understand it better today. Lord, we've seen this, these reasons for this comfort. Lord, we know that they have nothing to do with feelings or philosophy, but everything to do with truth. Lord, may this truth make us free today. And for those that you're drawing to your son, Jesus Christ, would you draw them to the cross for salvation? Bless the invitation now. We ask in the Lord Jesus Christ's great name. Amen. Our heads are still bowed. Our eyes are closed. Lord, I'm coming home is being played. You come to the front. Will you come home to him? Will you rest in this everlasting comfort tonight? It's for you to take to this world. Hey, I'd ask this. Maybe it's been a long, long time since you and your spouse came to the front and you prayed for this church. You'd pray for this church to be strengthened and built up in the most holy faith. Here we are in fall revival. When's the last time you've prayed for revival personally? Don't you want to see it? At any point in your lifetime, pray for it, ask for it. Hey, take this time right now. Maybe just go by yourself or take somebody around with you and just pray. Is there anybody that needs to do that? Find somebody else. Come right to this altar and pray. I don't want to embarrass anybody at all, but this is the time. We do not have any more time. Remember, our blessed hope, it could happen in a moment. We could be out of here, and it will be too late for this world to hear about Jesus Christ. Is there a neighbor that needs to hear about this everlasting comfort? Does your coworker need to hear about Christ? Is there a marriage that's falling apart that can only be sustained by the peace of God? Pray for them. Maybe commit to send an email this week or a text message or better yet, face to face. Upwards to 90% a people that are personally invited to a church service would say, yeah, I'd be interested in coming. Some of you are here tonight because somebody else invited you. You're comforted. You see somebody else distressed. I wonder if you've been bottling up this comfort and keeping it to yourselves. This is better than a moisturizer. This is meant to be spread all over the world. And we have this hope in earthen vessels here. Thank you, everyone. You can be seated. 
I wanted to take the time to read you a thank you note that I was going to send to you anyway, but I'm going to save a stamp tonight. <laughs> Philippians 1, 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Greetings, Pastor Dale Harris and Emmanuel. Glory to God, what a wonderful fall revival it has been. The spiritual response to the proclamation of Scripture this week has been powerful. To see the sweet people of God bring their friends and co-workers to each of these services has demonstrated faith and love. You've shown love and kindness to Rachel and the children through delicious meals, coffee shop visits, comfortable missions house, and memorable fellowship. We rejoice in each decision. We love our new Emmanuel friends. We look forward to next time. Hint, hint. <laughs> Sincerely, the Andrew Johnson family. Thank you so much. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, brother. Amen. Well, amen. Sure have been a blessing to us this week. Hope and pray as we close out the revival tonight. I talked about finishing, but I pray that it's just the beginning of renewed commitment and revivals for the church. And wilt thou not revive us again? Pray that God has relit that fire within us and that we'll see it burn in the days ahead and that we'll be faithful until we see Jesus coming, until we hear that trump of God sounding. So we're going to stand tonight, be dismissed in a word of prayer. Make sure you go by and get a prayer card. He's got a CD out there. That way you'll know to be praying for him. I don't know about you, and I'm I, it's just, boy, I, I love to use our missionary cards as bookmarks as you're going through your devotions or going through scriptures and turning the pages you see the faces you remember the names the families uh, and the needs and it reminds you to pray so make sure you get some of those and, and be in prayer for him also tonight let me remind you before i get in trouble there's a few desserts that are left uh, back there in the fellowship hall if you want to stay around the fellowship a little bit go get you a piece of whatever they have out there with some delicious desserts and Thank for all the meals, and thank you, Sister Lisa, for those desserts. They're really great, and just uh, each and every one that has worked so hard this week. Let's, be in, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight as we uh, close out the revival, and uh, be in prayer for the services this Sunday. So I'm going to ask uh, Brother George Wade, if he would, to please dismiss us tonight. <laughs>